For years, scientists have been struggling to explain bizarre sounds, some repeating, some heard only once, that come from the dark depths of the ocean. From bewildering hums to worrying bloops, the water transmits outlandish acoustic phenomena. One of these mysterious noises got named the upsweep. For the first time, this long train of sounds was registered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. One of the most unusual things about this signal is that it keeps changing, as if trying to confuse researchers even more. Like some unearthly howl, it varies from high to low frequencies and then back again. And you can hear it better in the spring and fall than in the winter and summer. Why the upsweep? It's simple. The sound travels from the bottom of the ocean towards its surface, as if sweeping up. Scientists do have a theory explaining this phenomenon. The activity of undersea volcanoes. Hot lava pouring into ice-cold ocean water could theoretically create such noises, but there's no proof found yet. Plus, the sound has been declining since 1991, even though it can still be detected. The bloop is the name given to an ultra-low frequency and incredibly powerful underwater sound that was recorded in 1997 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The bloop continued for approximately one minute. Having started from a low rumble, it gradually rose in frequency. It also kind of mimicked the noise created by marine animals, but its volume was so great that no living creature known to science could have made it. When the bloop occurred, underwater microphones managed to record it from a distance of 3,000 miles away. Rumor has it that the noise might have something to do with the fictional half-octopus monster Cthulhu, or some other colossal deep-water creature. But if you don't believe in monsters, science has another explanation. Iceberg fracturing. The thing is that ice quakes recorded in the Scotia Sea resemble the mysterious bloop a bit too much for it to be a coincidence. The whistle resembles this annoying sound when a kettle of boiling water is telling you it's time to make a cup of tea. But even though it may not be as blood-curdling as some other bizarre ocean sounds, it doesn't make it any less mysterious. Plus, the whistle is very elusive. In 1997, only one underwater microphone was able to pick it up, and therefore, researchers didn't manage to pinpoint the source of the noise. The most likely cause of the sound is an eruption of one of the submarine volcanoes. Have you ever heard of Julia? No, not your neighbor. I'm talking about this otherworldly sound. Listen to it. It was recorded in 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that ran aground somewhere in Antarctica. The sound was so loud that it was heard over a huge territory, and its duration was about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Slow down. That's the name given to a sound recorded in 1997 in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. The sound was called this way because it slowly decreased in frequency over seven minutes or so. It's been picked out a few more times since it was recorded for the first time. The source of the sound isn't very mysterious. Most likely, it was produced by a massive iceberg that became grounded in Antarctica, or it was caused by moving ice. By that, I mean the friction produced by a large ice sheet moving over land. The loneliest whale sound is often called the 52 hertz whale because the animal that creates it calls it at a unique for these creatures frequency. When you listen to this sound, it sounds like a low bass note. At the same time, it's much higher than the normal frequency of the whale call, which rings between 10 and 40 hertz. Interestingly, scientists have been listening to the world's loneliest whale for decades but haven't managed to figure out its precise location. Nobody knows whether the mammal is male or female, what species it is, or if the animal is still alive. After all, for the last time, its call was recorded in 2004. 
earth-shaking booming sounds have been reverberating off some parts of North Carolina for more than 150 years. Called Seneca guns, they're most often heard near the coast. The sounds are so powerful that they often rattle window panes and sometimes vibrate entire buildings. They can last from 1 to almost 10 seconds. Even though scientists haven't cracked this mystery yet, there are some theories. They range from earthquakes to severe distant storms and quarry blasts. But even though the ground trembles every time the phenomenon occurs, no seismic activity coincides with these events. So far, scientists have come to the conclusion that the mysterious sounds happen in the atmosphere, not on or under the surface of our planet. If this theory is true, bolides might be the answer. These extremely bright meteors often explode once they enter Earth's atmosphere. Or, Seneca guns might be born in the ocean. Sometimes, when enormous waves collide far away from the shore, you can hear it, even if you're nowhere near the coast. Seneca guns are a type of skyquakes. You don't need to travel to a particular part of the world to hear one of those. Mysterious sonic booms ramble from the sky everywhere, from the US to India and Japan. Just like Seneca guns, this sound phenomenon occurs mostly near the coast or a big body of water. Rattling glassware and windows in the nearby houses, skyquakes could be connected with ultra-fast airplanes breaking the sound barrier. But people started hearing the first skyquakes in 1824. The theories trying to explain this phenomenon include sand dunes shifting, meteors entering the atmosphere, distant volcanoes erupting, Earth's crust cracking during earthquakes, and even gas bursting out of underground vents in the sea or lake bottom. In different countries all over the world, people get paralyzed with fear after hearing otherworldly trumpet sounds that seem to be coming from the sky. The inhabitants of the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and the Philippines have already heard this hair-raising noise since it was first recorded in 2008. These sounds are sometimes called the sound of apocalypse. And although until recently, nobody could understand the origin of the sounds, NASA claims that there is nothing to be afraid of. The noise can be coming from our own planet. Usually, it's quiet and thus inaudible to the human ear. But when it gets louder, the outcome is the very trumpet sounds that scare people all over the world. Bristol Hum started in the 1970s when hundreds of Bristol inhabitants began to talk about a bizarre noise audible only at night. The noise was a low-level hum and nobody could identify or trace the source of the sound. But the strangest thing about the noise was that one day, it stopped as abruptly as it started. But not before people in other towns across Britain reported hearing similar sounds. Some time ago, the mysterious sound returned. In 2015, a group of French scientists claimed that they had solved the mystery of the Bristol hum. They stated that the culprit was ocean waves that made the ocean floor vibrate. But while it was all good and well, it didn't explain why the sound was around for only several years or why it chose to return. If you ever come to the town of Taos in New Mexico, don't let another strange and unexplained phenomenon send you running for the hills. This phenomenon is a faint, low-frequency hum ringing in the desert air and grating on your nerves. Even stranger, only 2% of people who live in Taos hear this noise. But for those who do, it's unstoppable torture. On top of that, everyone describes the sound in a different way from a quiet whir to an eerie hum or even persistent buzz. And while some people believe that the Taos hum is the result of unusual acoustics, the others suspect a bad case of mass hysteria. No one has located the origin of the hum yet. The coldest part of our planet, Antarctica, keeps surprising us. Take a look at this waterfall named Blood Falls. Reddish water falls from the white ice. Scientists concluded that the color is related to iron. The water coming from the glacier oxidizes and rusts when it's exposed to oxygen, and the red color occurs. Step on Mount Gandic. It lays eggs. Well, maybe not real eggs, but the stones certainly look like dinosaur eggs. That's why the mountain got its fame. 
The, let's call them stone eggs, formed in one part of the mountain over 500 million years ago. Interestingly, this phenomenon repeats once every 30 years. Eggs come out in various sizes and shades. The stones appear on the surface of the cliff. A study made in the area has revealed that the composition of the stones of the cliff isn't similar to other parts of the mountain. Here, calcareous rocks rule. They're more prone to erosion. They ripen off day by day. It took three decades for the stones to get to the egg shape. Yet, it's still a mystery how these rock formations can be so perfectly spherical and smooth. According to scientists, every stone egg has an organic core. They're made of shells, plant remains, fish teeth, and skeletons. Maybe this has something to do with it. Gulu Village is close to the stone eggs. Locals believe that these eggs are sacred. Villagers associate it with good fortune. In fact, nearly every family has one of these eggs in their house. Unfortunately, there are only about 70 eggs left, so if you want to see them, you gotta hurry up! The Rich Hat structure is a circular geological phenomenon in the Sahara Desert near Mauritania. It's made out of rocks in layers, and these layers look very much like rings. No wonder the unique structure even got NASA's attention. Up from the sky, the geological feature seems to be swirling and spinning. Scientists are still not sure how these rings got there. Some say it was an asteroid impact. Many others believe that it was a natural geological process. To them, the Rich Hat structure is an uplifted and eroded dome. Geologists often classify it as a domed anticline. The scientists discovered that the rocks at the center are older than the ring-shaped outer rocks. So it seems like the stones have been eroded to flat rock layers. Anyway, there's no valid explanation for this phenomenon, and the 28-mile-long mystery of the Sahara is still to be solved. Number 4 is Rapa Nui, or Isla de Pasqua, but I bet you know it as Easter Island. Yeah, it's got three names. It was discovered by Jacob Rogovine, who actually never intended to look for that island. He just casually landed there one Sunday. That's where the name comes from. Jacob was supposed to find Terra Australis. Disclaimer, it's not Australia. This one never existed and was nothing but a hypothetical continent. Plus, he wanted to peek at Davis Land, which was believed to have once been seen by Edward Davis, the pirate, not Edward Davis the saxophone player. Jacob failed at that too, though nobody ever saw that island except for the pirate Davis. Jacob may have failed to discover some lands he wanted to, but he discovered Easter Island instead. This is an island and special territory of Chile, located in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. It's on my list because nearly 1,000 stone statues called Moai were found there. They were created by the Rapa Nui people. Nearly all statues represent gigantic heads, but there are also a small number of figures kneeling with their hands over their stomachs. Each statue represented chiefs or other important members of Easter Island society. To curve those statues, the locals used volcanic stones that were softened. Our next stop is the gateway to the underworld. Nah, don't worry. This is just how people labeled Darvaza gas crater in Turkmenistan. This giant natural gas crater has been there for five decades. This crater is continuously burning gases. The president of the country wants experts to find a way to extinguish this continuous firing pit. This site was created by people accidentally in 1971 while working on a natural gas project. Ever since then, the flames have been on, and it's become a tourist attraction. Mysterious constructions are sometimes built in our era, too. We don't have to go millions of years ago to long-gone civilizations. Edward Leedskollen single-handedly built a structure called Coral Castle in Homestead, Florida. He didn't use any large machinery. He carved and sculpted more than 1,100 tons of coral rock in 28 years until 1951. It's a mystery how he managed to do it all by himself. Leedskallen sculpted the sedimentary rock into different objects, such as walls, tables, chairs, a fountain, and a sundial. There's, of course, a legend behind this mystery, too. He was inspired to build the structure after being abandoned by his fiancée on their wedding day. Uh-oh, runaway bride! Well, he wanted to prove his love to her and the world, so he wanted to do something extraordinary. Well, he definitely nailed it! 
Now, let's talk a little bit about the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles. There are millions of circular patches in hundreds of miles, ranging from 10 to 65 feet in diameter. They're called fairy circles because they look like a fairy or an otherworldly creature made them. These are essentially oval-shaped soil surrounded by grass. There are a lot of local beliefs surrounding the creator of these marks. Yet science says something else. Biologists and mathematicians have been puzzled by the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles for decades. There is more than one theory to explain this phenomenon. Here's one popular theory. The water is limited in the desert, so plants compete to reach the water. Some plants expand and thrive into a patch, but smaller plants nearby cannot get the necessary water to live. In the end, some vegetation disappears, and the remaining ones stay at the patch's edges. That's why they form such regular distant gaps. What if I tell you that there is a hill in Lay wow. City, India, where instead of rolling downwards, things roll uphill? It's an optical illusion. The road looks like it's a sloping hill because of its surrounding landscapes. Yet the road actually goes down. These kinds of hills are called magnetic hills or gravity hills. Scientific explanations vary. The most common theory says that the hill has such a strong magnetic force that it can pull cars in the vicinity. Now, how about seeing some flaming rocks? Yanartash spread over an area of over 3 square miles. The place is located on a rocky mountain in southwest Turkey near the town of Chiaralea. Yanartash got its name from its appearance. It literally means flaming stone. The rocks have been flaming for at least 2,500 years, and they'll probably keep burning for the coming decades. The mountain where the rocks are is an inactive volcano, so it's full of tiny fumaroles that release gases such as methane. The gas ignites when it comes into contact with oxygen and creates the flaming effect. Uh, and by the way, back in the day, sailors used the flames as a natural lighthouse, as it's really close to the sea. Today, it's more of a tourist attraction, though. Hikers love it, too. Now, walk on this frozen Lake Abraham in Canada. In winter, the frozen water gets filled with ice bubbles. It looks magical, but these white orbs aren't that safe. They consist of flammable methane gas. Ew. Beauty can be misleading. The next one is from Racetrack Death Valley, USA. There is a dry lake bed with moving rocks. Now these odd rocks look as if they've been pushed or dragged by someone or something. They leave both a trail and a mystery behind. The force behind all this is now understood. Surprise! It's the wind and some ice. Scientists say the wind pushes the rocks during brief windows when the soil is covered with ice. Now I can't help. It was hot in the tropics, a type of heat unknown to the men aboard the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria ships, led by Italian explorer Christopher Columbus. It had been months since these men left their home cities in Europe, and until then, Europe was all they knew. They were given a difficult and even dangerous task. Spain hired Columbus to find a new western route to Asia. They needed new routes for trading and buying spices, but it was far from a simple job. I mean, crossing the ocean never is. Little did those sailors know that their lives were about to change forever. Land in sight! Someone must have shouted on board. But when they finally stepped on that new foreign land, they discovered they were not in Asia. They had landed in the Americas. You've probably heard this tale before. Historically speaking, Columbus arrived in the Americas in 1492. But what would have happened if Columbus's ship had faced a lethal storm in the Atlantic Ocean and had never made it to the new land? What would today's history look like? First things first, nobody discovered anything. When we say that the Americas were discovered, we're kind of ignoring the millions of people who already lived there. You see, the Americas were only discovered from Europe's point of view. Columbus would only have discovered something if when he got there, he was faced with acres and acres of empty land. But that was not the case at all. Second, Columbus was not the first explorer to land in the Americas. Believe it or not, 
The Vikings approached American shores in the 10th century. Their expeditions have been well documented and accepted by scholars. Here's what might have happened. Around the year 1000 CE, Viking explorer Leif Erikson sailed to a place called Vinland. Cute name, huh? It's now a region in Canada called Newfoundland. But his crew didn't stay too long. They arrived to find 10 Native Americans napping under their overturned canoes. They attempted some trade, but I'm guessing the Vikings weren't too friendly and the Americans didn't really like them. The Vikings' account of the encounter shows they felt outnumbered and menaced, so they sailed away back to their land. That makes sense, right? As I said earlier, there were millions of people living in the ginormous continent of the Americas. Any foreigner would be outnumbered there. Now take a look at what North America looked like before our buddy Chris got there. It was not divided into the normal states we're used to. And if Columbus had never arrived, the United States would probably never have been united to begin with. After all, there were hundreds of first Americans living in these lands, and they lived amongst their own tribes, quite different from the Europeans. It's not accurate to think that there were no political systems going on in the Americas before Europeans arrived. We just need to understand that they were different from what we're used to today. When Europeans arrived, they imported their belief systems with them, from religious beliefs and language systems to things as simple as clothing habits. If the Americas had developed on their own, maybe their sense of fashion would be completely different today. You see, Europeans had a developed sense of fashion by the time they arrived in the West. They wore things such as this and this. But those don't really work in the tropics, do they? For them, fashion had to do with showing a certain economic status, while in the Americas, that didn't exist. For Native Americans, clothing was mainly functional and related to the weather. In warmer climates, Native people would wear short-like cloths to cover their intimate parts. They would walk bare-chested and use shoes known as moccasins. Yes, similar to the moccasins you probably own. In colder climates, they would resort to using leather and fur parkas. Of course, there was always the special clothing used for ceremonial purposes. So I'm guessing that if Columbus never reached the Americas, Brands such as The Gap, Hollister, and Forever 21 would have never existed. But we could live with that, couldn't we? Here's a wild thought. Let's say that by the 1700s, Native Americans had developed complex engineering skills. They built big boats, maybe a bit smaller in size than the traditional European ships, and decided to venture across the ocean. Let's say they were the ones who arrived on European shores, in places such as Spain and Portugal. They carried gifts and goods with them for trading, of course. This was also a common practice amongst them back home, known as potlatch. Sure, they were received with suspicion by the Europeans, who had only ever traded with Asia. But with this inverted encounter, a different type of relationship began between Native Americans and Europeans. Since Europeans didn't claim ownership of the Americas, the people from the so-called New Land weren't considered inferior to them. Actually, they stood side by side as equals, each one with their own power and set of knowledge. Native Americans taught Europeans a new type of ruling system, a more decentralized one. So modern-day structures of government would look really different. Maybe Europeans decided that four years was a long time for someone to hold decision power, so they implemented smaller and more frequent elections. Oh, and the landscape of European cities also changed a lot. Instead of huge statues made of copper and bronze showing men and ships on their way to the Americas, the Europeans built totem poles in honor of their alliances with first Americans. In terms of medical and medicinal knowledge, they had a lot to exchange about. While Europeans were making advances in traditional medicine, Americans had developed an impressive knowledge of herbs that could heal a series of things. Before they knew it, Europeans were selling different varieties of plants in their pharmaceutical establishments. They had one big barrier though, language. Since Europeans never arrived on American shores, they also never taught their language to Americans. So maybe in this scenario, both cultures brought in their best linguists and tried creating a new language from scratch. Something that could be comprehensible from both perspectives and that could encompass both of their worldviews. 
The implications of this on modern day life would be really profound if you stop to think about it. Let's say that this newly created language involved some symbols and drawings in it. You see, Native Americans often told stories using symbols known as pictograms. They were quite literal sometimes. As you can see, a mountain was represented by, well, a mountain. It's crazy to think that this system of communication has been around for 5,000 years since it was actually invented by the Sumerians. And hey, maybe even our laptop keyboards would come equipped with these symbols, and you could write more visually hybrid and fun emails than the ones you write today. The American landscape would have also changed. You see, if neither Columbus nor any of the other European dudes that went after him reached the so-called new land, Central and Latin American cities would look completely different than they do today. Maybe the bustling empires of the time, such as the Inca, the Maya, and the Aztec, would have grown immensely. To be fair, they were already pretty big by the time Europeans got there. Some pre-Columbian Maya cities were as big as medieval London and Paris in terms of population. But oh my, the Mayan Empire would have grown so much that it could have spread out all over of Central America. They could have developed their pyramid building craft up to the point that they managed to build an even larger pyramid than the Giza Pyramid in Egypt. So tourists would come from all over the world to visit. Ah, and in South America, let's just say the region could have turned into a huge forest, bigger than the Amazon. The Inca could have spread through the Andes and then into the mainland. Places such as Brazil and Argentina never existed. But in their place, there would have been dreamy tropical settlements, which would have become a worldwide reference in sustainable living. Have you ever wondered why mountains seem so still and silent? Well, prepare to be amazed because these majestic landforms have some hidden talents. You see, mountains are actually quite the performers. They have their own unique songs and dance routines. What does it mean and how does it work? Well, let's see. Get ready for a chilling revelation. Mount Everest has a secret nighttime symphony. And this mysterious music will send shivers down your spine. When darkness falls over the Himalayas, a strange, eerie chorus echoes through the glaciers surrounding the majestic peak. A team of researchers embarked on a quest to unravel the mystery. Led by the glaciologist Evgeny Podolsky, they trekked through the freezing temperatures of the Nepalese Himalayas. Their goal? To uncover the source of these hair-raising noises. The team was amazed by the incredible size and beauty of Mount Everest. During the day, the weather was nice and they could work comfortably. However, when night came, it became extremely cold, reaching temperatures as low as minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit. At that moment, something interesting happened. The ice on the mountain started to break apart and make loud booming sounds that echoed through the valley. To solve the mystery, the team used advanced technology that is typically used to measure earthquakes. They placed sensors on the surface of the glacier and listened to the vibrations it created. They also looked at information about temperature and wind. By comparing all of this data, they made a very important and exciting discovery. The culprit behind this frozen orchestra? It's the sudden decrease in temperature. The icy surface of the glacier is very sensitive to these changes, causing it to crack and split with loud booming noises. This discovery helps scientists understand how glaciers behave in a world where climate change is becoming more pronounced. This adventure is really important because it gives scientists who study glaciers and the climate in faraway places like the Himalayas very valuable information. The melting of glaciers in that area is happening really fast. And that's a big problem. It's a serious threat to South Asia. Recent research shows that the glaciers have been melting 10 times faster in the past 40 years compared to the previous 700 years. But this isn't the only reason why mountains can make strange noises. Other mountains might also sing their own songs. For example, Mount Matterhorn. Guess what? Everything around us has its own special rhythm. Objects vibrate at certain frequencies because of their shape and what they're made of. You've probably seen it before with tuning forks and wine glasses. When they're hit with the right frequency, they start shaking and making sounds. 
But here's something cool. Even mountains have their own groove. They vibrate in their own unique way. Jeffrey Moore and his team of adventurous scientists wanted to find out if mountains can dance to their own music, just like bridges and tall buildings. They thought that the special shapes of mountains might make them vibrate at certain frequencies, which is called resonance. But testing this idea wasn't easy. Unlike buildings that engineers can shake or bridges that vehicles can drive over, mountains are massive and hard. It's hard to make them move on purpose. Not giving up, Moore and his team took on a big project. They wanted to study how the shaking of the earth affected the famous Matterhorn Mountain. This incredible mountain is located on the border of Italy and Switzerland. It looks like a pyramid. It's really tall, reaching about 15,000 feet high. It has four sides facing north, south, east, and west. With the help of helicopters, the scientists put special devices called seismometers in specific places on the mountain. One was placed at the very top and used solar power to work. It was as small as a coffee cup. Another seismometer was tucked beneath the floorboards of a cozy hut on the mountain, and a third one was placed at the base of the mountain to compare the measurements. Together, they were the tiny observers that kept recording the movements of the mountain all the time. And they finally detected it. Even though the mountain's movements are incredibly small, scientists discovered that the Matterhorn gently sways back and forth about once every two seconds. What's truly surprising is that the top of the mountain moves up to 14 times more than its base. The Eiffel Tower kind of does the same thing. This giant iron structure is a pro at handling windy days, and when a storm blows through, it's not afraid to show off its swaying skills. It's like the tower is saying, hey wind, bring it on. But the reason behind the mountain's movement isn't just wind, as it may seem. So why do mountains do that? Why do they dance and make a humming sound? Are they having a party that we're not invited to? Well, it's all because of something called seismic energy. When earthquakes happen in different parts of the world, their energy travels through the earth and causes the mountains to vibrate. The oceans also join in this mountain music. When waves move across the ocean floor, they create vibrations called microseisms. It's like the earth's own heartbeat felt all around the world. And guess what? The frequency of these vibrations matches the way the Matterhorn sways. It's like the mountain and the oceans are chilling together. So the next time you see a mountain, remember that it's not just standing still. It's actually part of a global symphony created by the Earth itself. This research helps us learn how earthquakes can affect steep mountains that are prone to landslides and avalanches. It also gives us a new way to appreciate mountains like the Matterhorn. They have their own hidden songs, swaying and vibrating to a mysterious melody deep within the earth. But there's one more pretty cool thing about the mountains. They don't just talk themselves. They may also influence the way we talk. Turns out, languages spoken in high altitude areas have special sounds that you won't hear elsewhere. After studying 567 languages, linguists found that 92 of them use a special kind of sound called ejectives. These sounds are made by pushing air out forcefully from the back of the throat. This creates bursts of speech that give these languages their distinctiveness. Scientists were really surprised by this connection. These sounds, like a strong K and Ka, are not common in English or European languages. But some indigenous languages in North America and the area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea have them. What's even more puzzling is that Tibetan languages, spoken in mountains, don't use adjectives. Linguists are curious to unravel this mystery and learn more about how mountains and language are connected. So, why do some languages spoken in the mountains have special sounds? Well, it's a bit of a mystery. Researchers have some cool ideas. One idea is that these sounds might help people keep their throats from getting dry when they talk in the dry air of the mountains. Another idea is that the lower air pressure up there makes it easier to make these sounds but scientists are still figuring out the real reason. Although some experts are not entirely convinced by this explanation. They say that while geography can influence language, there are other reasons why languages might be similar. Like borrowing words from nearby languages or being close to each other. But this research has still given us some amazing insights. Mountains not only shape the way our world looks, but they also shape the way we talk. 
So, the next time you're exploring a mountainous area, listen carefully to the local language. You might hear unique sounds and words that are influenced by the mountains themselves. It's like nature is sharing its own special secrets through the language of the people who live there. And remember that the mountains themselves also have a voice, and they're speaking to us in their own special way. Scientists are still on an exciting adventure to uncover their secrets. So let's see what are some cool things they'll find out in the future. Stay tuned. You hear the word Paris, and a picture of the Eiffel Tower comes straight into your mind. Or croissants. Or maybe you imagine going on a romantic stroll in the city of love. Or croissants. But not many know that right below the bustling city of Paris, there is a series of underground passages, the catacombs. They're home to the remains of more than 6 million people. Whoa. But it wasn't always like that. Paris used to be a vast swamp. It was because most of the city was submerged in water at one time. Due to this, once the areas rose to the surface, the ground became rich in minerals, the most important being limestone. To extract it and use it to develop Paris, underground mines were dug up somewhere around the 14th century. They were dug horizontally to prevent collapse and to deal with the weight of the ceiling. Most of these mines were set up on the right side of the River Seine. Soon, Paris started expanding beyond its old city walls. Here's where it got tricky. The city started building on top of the land where they had dug all those tunnels. This caused some big problems, like the ground collapsing. In 1774, one of the roads in the suburbs collapsed about 100 feet into the ground. Due to rising safety concerns, officials decided to abandon the mines. The quarries were checked, and the tunnels were renovated to avoid future disasters. The bones ended up in the tunnels because of another major problem Paris faced a few years later. The growing population of the city caused an increase in the number of bodies. Cemeteries became overcrowded. And the city was actually so bad that, at one point, bodies could not be taken care of properly. They started to rot and spread harmful bacteria. So those who were in charge of Paris got an idea. They picked a new spot that was like a secret hideout for bones one of the old mines. The process of moving the bones from cemeteries to the tunnel started in the late 1780s. They began with the biggest cemetery in Paris, the San Innocent Cemetery. They didn't want to scare people, so they moved the bones at night. The remains went into two big holes in the ground and then got stacked in the tunnels by the quarry workers. They continued moving the bones until Paris developed into a city in the 1860s. The official name given to the collection of mines turned cemetery was the Paris Municipal Ossuary. But this name never became popular, and the tunnels instead became known as the catacombs. While the bones were still being added to the collection, the officials saw fit to open the place for public viewing in the year 1809. Tourists had to make a prior appointment and sign a guest book. As time passed, Famous people started visiting, including the future King Charles X, Austrian Emperor Francis I, and Napoleon III. Of course, the rules for visiting have been changing over time. But now the catacombs, also known as the ossuary of Denfer Rochereau, have become a famous tourist spot. Around 5 million people come to explore it every year. What drives them? Well, in addition to the creepy but rich history, the catacombs are also considered one of the most haunted places on Earth, and there are several unsolved mysteries surrounding them. Some years back, a camcorder was discovered in the catacombs with a bit of footage. ABC Family showed the video in their documentary. In the clip, you can see a man very deep inside the catacombs, exploring alone. The video is from his point of view, and he sees something strange. He runs away terrified and eventually drops his camera. What happened to this man is still unknown. He was never found or identified. There are also reports of people getting lost in the catacombs, the most famous being a doorkeeper who got lost in 1793. His body was found 11 years later near an exit. How he passed away remains a mystery. There are also some not-so-eerie but equally strange mysteries surrounding the catacombs. There are people who like exploring the tunnels on their own. They're known as cataphiles. These people go into the quarries that have been abandoned to the public and long forgotten. 
Some explorers discovered secret water pools in the abandoned areas, and people would go to take a dip there. In 2004, police patrolling an unexplored area came across a 5,300-square-foot cavern with a movie theater. There was a screen, projection equipment, some classic movies, and even chairs. There was also a restaurant-like setting nearby, three telephone lines, and, well, electricity, which hinted that a group of people had been living there or regularly visiting. But when the police came back three days later with experts to find the source of the electricity, they found that the wire had been cut off. Only a note was left behind. Do not try to find us. Such enthusiasts existed in the past, too. Once, a Parisian farmer did the same and came across button mushrooms growing in the catacombs. He saw an opportunity to make easy money, and he actually created mushroom farms in the tunnels. He even got official permission for it. By 1950, a hundred farmers had been working inside growing mushrooms. There's also a scary legend about the catacombs that some people believe in. According to it, at midnight, unexplainable voices can be heard in the catacombs. They try to convince people to go further inside the catacombs until they can't find their way out. There's no strong evidence whether this story is true or not, but thinking about it is still scary. Due to safety issues, today, only a small part of the catacombs can be legally toured by the public, less than 2 miles, while the catacombs go on for 200 miles. And still, the tour is an hour long, and it perfectly captures what's worth seeing. Solo traveling is extremely dangerous, as there is the possibility of getting lost. Mm, no thanks. In 2017, two teenagers entered the system through a secret passage. They were found three days later and had to be treated for hypothermia. The tunnels, damp and old, have an average temperature of 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Keep in mind that the entrance alone is uncomfortable enough to turn some people away. To get inside, you have to go down a winding staircase that takes you a little more than 65 feet below the surface. In the beginning, you find yourself in a well-lit room filled with interesting information and displays. But as you move forward, the place gets eerily silent. You pass through a creepy entrance that boldly declares this in French, which when translated English is something like, stop, this is the empire of doom. It's not exactly a warm welcome, and that's because the Paris catacombs are known for their haunted reputation. As you move deeper, the sounds of the world above fade away, and soon you are surrounded by the silence of the earth below. The bones themselves are placed strategically, almost in artistic patterns. This was the idea of a man who was once in charge of the place. He turned the bones into a kind of underground museum with cool structures like columns, plaques, altars, and even some weirdly shaped forms that some people consider art. Popular all year round, the catacombs become particularly loaded around Halloween. People organize special parties or events near the place too. But the most bizarre thing was offered by the catacombs themselves through Airbnb. The famous rental service allowed two guests to sleep in the catacombs. They were offered a bed for Halloween night and breakfast. Upon checking in, they were told tales in the history of the catacombs. This way, they went to bed fully aware of the fact that they were sleeping among the remains of 6 million people. Yes, it remains to be seen. So tonight, go out and look at the moon through a telescope, and you'll see many craters. No one still knows how they appeared there. Some of them have formed recently. Scientists have discovered a double crater on the moon that appeared for a strange reason. In March, a rocket crashed into the moon, and no one knows who owned it and why it left such a trail. If a regular rocket had fallen there, it would have left one hole. A standard space rocket has a heavy engine on one side and a lighter fuel tank on the other. But this time, there had to be two heavy sides on one rocket to leave a double crater. That's strange. No one knows what it is, and no one has claimed to be the owner. It was probably part of a large three-ton rocket. This piece had been flying in space for several years. At first, astronomers thought it belonged to SpaceX, but the company denied this claim. Also, they thought that China had launched the rocket, but this was also wrong. In the near future, NASA experts hope to find out the truth. The problem with tracking such rockets in space debris is that this is quite expensive. 
Companies don't want to spend too much money on it. But soon, this will change. People will have to spend billions of dollars to monitor garbage or destroy it, since it's getting too crowded in space. Space companies will have to solve this problem, as it poses a serious danger to satellites and spacecraft. Just take a look. There are millions of pieces of satellites and rockets flying in space. Some of them are the size of a basketball, others are as tiny as a raindrop. The total weight of all this debris is about 9,000 tons. This is almost 2,000 tons heavier than the Eiffel Tower. Okay, all this garbage is floating there, so what? The problem is that it's not just floating, it's moving at a speed of 17,500 miles per hour. A tennis ball will fall apart into several pieces at such a speed on the surface of our planet because of air resistance. But there's no air in space. Nothing prevents a tiny piece of metal from reaching a speed 20 times faster than the speed of sound. A piece of paint at this speed can easily damage the casing of a spaceship. Once, several shuttle portholes were replaced because of the damage caused by flying chunks of paint. Now imagine what a piece of metal the size of a basketball can do to a spaceship. It could bring down the International Space Station. Many satellites were destroyed by space debris that crashed into them. And when those satellites exploded, they burst into thousands of small parts, which also turned into dangerous flying objects. For example, in 1996, a fragment of a rocket damaged 10 years earlier crashed into a French satellite. In 2009, a failed spacecraft destroyed another commercial ship. As a result of the collision, about 2,300 tracked fragments appeared, as well as lots of tiny untracked ones. Today, satellite operators receive warnings about potential collisions with space debris. But these messages are often either inaccurate or reach the operators too late. Imagine that a screw is flying at great speed toward your satellite. You'll hardly have time to dodge it. Perhaps it won't hit your satellite at all. This uncertainty makes these warning sensors useless. The problem becomes much more serious when it concerns the ISS crew members. A durable spacesuit can't guarantee protection from flying debris. And the station itself is too large to save itself from big objects by dodging. To keep astronauts safe, scientists have a catalog of things that are the size of softballs or bigger. They monitor thousands of fragments and analyze their trajectories, material, and dimensions. Next, they use the pizza box method to dodge garbage. This is the unofficial name for an imaginary square that is used to calculate the risks of a collision with space debris. So imagine a giant pizza box. It is 2.5 miles deep, 30 miles wide, and 30 miles long. Now put the entire International Space Station in this box. Yeah, okay, you can have it with pepperoni. Anyway, if some space object is heading toward the edge of the box, the crew will begin to develop a plan of action. The box's radius is quite large compared to the station, since it's difficult to calculate the debris' trajectory. If there's a chance that something might approach the box, then it can also damage the station. When operators receive a signal about approaching debris, they analyze it. Depending on the data received, the crew begins to act in a certain way. If it's something small and heading for some part of the ISS, the astronaut should evacuate from this part. And after that, they'll do repairs there. If something big is approaching, the entire station can perform an evasive maneuver with the help of the engines or a docked spacecraft. One such trick required about five hours of hard work. The station is a big, clumsy ship, so it's important to know about the threat in advance. From 1999 to 2020, the ISS made 29 maneuvers to avoid collisions. Three of them occurred in 2020. And there will be more since the amount of garbage increases. If some object is too big and fast and can damage critical components, and it's impossible to dodge, the entire crew will have to evacuate. In the future, NASA and other space agencies will have to think about how to destroy this debris or remove it from orbit. One option is catching everything with extensive space nets. One agency suggested developing a solar sail that clings to debris and propels it to a low orbit. Another wanted to use an electrodynamic cable to slow down the speed of space debris with the current. This maneuver will cause space garbage to move toward the surface of Earth and burn up in the atmosphere. 
But what if one of these pieces still reaches the ground? Even now, many satellite parts fall on Earth. Fortunately, this is not so dangerous. The probability of cosmic garbage falling on your house is minimal. In addition, 70% of our planet is covered with water. Of the remaining 30%, only 3-10% to are occupied by people. Almost all space debris falls into the ocean or unpopulated parts of dry land. But let's say some part of a satellite damages your property. In that case, the company that owns the space object will cover the losses. Such cases are rare and occur because of accidents in orbit. But sometimes, companies intentionally abandon their satellites. If a spacecraft is out of order, they turn it off and use the remaining fuel to slow it out of orbit and drop it in a safe place. Almost all such objects fall in the region of the spacecraft cemetery. It's located at the most remote point on Earth, Point Nemo. It's in the southern Pacific Ocean, east of New Zealand. The nearest island is more than a thousand miles away. The distance to the International Space Station is much smaller. It's challenging to get to this place since no ships travel there. That's why most satellites end up in that area. It looks like an endless sea. The ocean there absorbs explosive waves of any power without consequences. Even if some fallen ship or rocket causes a giant wave, it dissipates long before it reaches dry land. Fish and other marine creatures are also not at risk. Point Nemo is one of the least inhabited areas on Earth. Underwater currents carry nutrients through the ocean, and tiny living creatures such as photoplankton and other organisms feed on them. But these currents don't reach Point Nemo. Another way to deliver nutrients in the ocean is wind. But there's almost no wind at Point Nemo. This place doesn't have enough food to let large life forms develop. Just imagine how lonely and silent it is there. Sometimes, a broken rocket breaks the silence, crashing into the water at great speed and descending to the seabed, where thousands of other satellites are waiting to welcome it. <laughs>